Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Based on a True Story. I'm Matthew Baxter. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Stolzner. And Shalom. I'm Blake Smith. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little hint at what we're going to be discussing today. That's right. The possession. The possession. <laughs> but I think, I, think, I think a lot of people know this movie as the Dybbuk Box. Rather it than is, the it possession. Is, it is the Dybbuk Box movie. It is. Yeah. yeah but yeah, there exactly. is actually a Dybbuk Box movie as well. So we have to be careful. Oh, yeah. is okay. that one also based on a true story? I'm sure it's probably. <laughs> is this one? <laughs> is the, yeah, that's wow. Very, yeah. very well asked there, Karen. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Look, spoilers. I... <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> I enjoyed the film. I think in and really? of itself, yeah, I think it's a fun film and it has shades of other movies like The Exorcist, which we'll get into shortly. But uh, yeah, I think it's a fun film. But when taken into consideration with the backstory, maybe not so fun. I, I yeah. felt like it was an easy bake oven, too much, too formulaic, <laughs> like, uh, but, but That's very Hollywood. pretty, very pretty. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yeah. I like seeing Jeffrey Dean Morgan in almost anything. And, uh, you know, his in his background, he, he was actually going to be a professional basketball player. That was his goal. Uh, and he, uh, oh, he he got an injury and didn't get to do that. So it was well, cool. Well, he was the like, coach in, a, in this. Exactly. So he gets to yeah. bring those basketball skills back to play. So when he was shooting in that scene, probably really shooting. Yeah. So that was based wow. on true events. That's that part was true. The only part. Well, <laughs> yeah. all right. Well, thank you over. everyone for joining us. Um, <laughs> yeah. Next week, uh, no. Uh, yeah, this. I I thought it was a a fun movie, and uh, Blake and I had uh, talked very briefly before the show about how um, when you look at the other movies that came out around the same time, um, this was one of the better movies. Uh, it, it really was, and it has a lot of bad about it even setting aside the whole, this is a true story. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, there, there's a plot hole here and there uh, mm. that uh, we'll probably have to examine. But yeah. the, the the movie kind of starts out, when did this come out? 2012, I believe? I yes. think, yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, so the movie starts out with uh, this uh, this older woman standing in what appears to be her living room, lounge room, uh staring at this box sitting on the the mantle mm -hmm. um and it's like she's having some sort of communication with it but not yeah. a happy communication she seems to be very upset about mm -hmm. it um and then she decides that's it you're evicted and uh went to i wish you go get a hammer i believe yeah um, so we got a ball team she hammer she's gonna smash it yeah yeah and uh it did not go well would, I thought that was a that was not. probably a metaphor for the uh the control that television has over us all. Uh it talks <laughs> to us, but we can't talk back, and you want to just smash it with a hammer. And you have That's to shoot it right. like Elvis, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I thought I that completely. that was such a violent scene. Uh I now I had seen this movie, I guess, around the time that it's uh, that it came out. <laughs> and I've forgotten a lot of it. Sorry. Oh, really? Really? You saw it in the theaters? Oh, uh, no, no. I, I guess when it came out, you know, for oh, video. On, streaming on video, video whatever, gotcha, gotcha, whatever gotcha. format it, it came out on. And yep. But I'd forgotten a lot of the plot. And so to watch that scene again, I thought, wow, that was just so violent. And I think that that should have killed her the way that it, thrust her back against the wall and threw her against the coffee table and her head yeah. smacked and she's bleeding. And yeah, I, the way she was lying there when her son was trying to get into the house to check on her, I thought, oh, she's gone. So I couldn't yeah, remember it, that she had survived. It looked like, you know, Peter Griffith, you know, Griffin after he had like fallen out of a plane or something. Um, yeah. How they always have, you know, the arms everywhere. Um, yeah, it, 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 when you're that age, usually just bending over to get a spoon will break your hip. So it was really surprising yeah, that she's just walked she it off. So to speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that that was instrumental to the scene, um, which which comes on later on where they're at the yard sale and the little girl gets to well, see her. And It was a little confusing, though, in a sense, because it seemed like the yard sale was on one side of the street. But the little girl takes the box across the street and sees through the window that the this woman is in a, a bed being in a convalescent sort of state 
Mm. And I was trying to figure out what, why is the art still happening over there? If the, the whole story just starts to break down immediately at that point. No, just, well, no, it was, <laughs> I, just, it was, I think it was bad. I think it was bad pacing there because uh, it was supposed to show her kind of walking alongside the house and the, the yard sale was out front. But gotcha. it, it, is, it was hard to see. It was like, what's what's exactly going on? But the only real tip off you had to that was that the carer, whether she was a nurse or whatever, was the same person that she saw going in the front door um, and getting yes. her, uh, uh, you know, a stink eye. So, yes. Um, yeah. But I think we should backtrack a little bit just to talk about the family. So you've got the situation with the family. Uh, they've gone through the husband and wife exes have gone through a divorce, I think, three months before. And so you have this this broken home. And uh, the two girls, I guess, have got joint custody, uh, go to the father's house on the weekend, and he's moved from his little apartment to a brand new house. And I guess that really sets the scene for them needing to go to this yard sale so that he can get some, I think, uh, dinnerware, crockery or something. If the and, kids uh, complain that he's he's living in a divorce home with, you know, where's the Ikea? He's got nothing. There's no decorations. And the house does look really nice. It looks very it fancy. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, in some ways, I think it just, it was very modern and everything it didn't really suit him. He just seemed like a kind of bachelor, you know, bachelor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Basketball it's, playing bachelor. It, yeah. Um, it was a lot of home for a guy who only sees the kids on the weekend. So, yeah. and I guess, you know, and again, to, yeah, such a, such a trope. Them. Yeah. Such a trope. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's like uh, Mrs. Doubtfire uh, ready to happen here, you know? The only way you can see his well, kids is if he dresses up like a woman now. And so, what were you <laughs> saying of Kira Sedgwick as well? Uh, well, you, you know, were saying that excellent that's a kind of casting. typical yeah, type excellent. cast role for her. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, she's had some excellent roles and she's uh, uh, been nominated and awarded uh, quite a few awards and everything. But I always see her either as a widower, divorcee. Uh, always very disappointed in the ex, uh, ex-husband and, and men in general. Um, and she played that role fantastic in this oh, as except well. Except for the, the dentist, her boyfriend. Yeah, yeah. But what, wasn't he from Melrose Place? So Yes, <laughs> yeah. I, I, taking a little bit of a step <laughs> up maybe, you know. Wait, Kelly. it was like, oh, yeah, what, 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 her ex-husband's a college basketball coach and her boyfriend's a dentist. She she's uh she's got a nose for uh income, I think. So yeah. 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 Well, I thought that it was rather rude that he'd done some work on the teenage girl. So that was uh that uh Hannah was the teenager. Yeah. And I think you you're too young to really get any kind of dental work at that point. And I don't know what he did if he put in some veneers or something. But I think it's an Invisalign. Was, oh uh, he wanted overbite correction. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So, but still should have um, been with his with the father's permission but anyway yeah yeah that's it, a, it, a, i totally digress it's not relevant to the <laughs> dibic box <laughs> at all we're uh, all just but, kind of outraged here you yeah. know because we have children well uh, um yeah <laughs> i have a guy like i don't i don't can we put a pin in the thing about uh like Dentist. there was this whole thing about uh the 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 movie sort of like we're introduced to the kids because the youngest one wants to be she wants to promote uh vegetarianism in the school and it's kind of like sort of set up to be a socially activist Uh, she really wants to like make the world a better place so when she becomes uh under the effects of the thing in this box you know it's a big character change for her so yeah i mean i wasn't buying the vegetarianism thing when she was on the floor with the raw steak in her mouth well um, i would yeah that was the thing it was like why was if the house is is vegetarian why was there a steak in the fridge yeah. i think that dentist must have snuck Come it on. in there but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, but i do like her I, I think she's a brilliant little actor i mean her decline oh yeah is uh astounding and i mean she goes from being this sweet little girl who's just trying to who's disappointed and wants her parents to get back together again uh the sweet little innocent thing to becoming a, a demon i guess yeah <laughs> and, there, and there didn't was, uh, the the girl who played hannah wasn't she perfect in a very irritated teenager role oh she had that down yeah <sighs> yeah yeah that nice. all seemed very, very legit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I think it is interesting when, uh, well, obviously things start happening to the little girl when she opens up the box because for some time she can't open it. It's like one of those puzzle boxes and it's difficult for, for her to, to prize open. And well, I think the father has a go at it and he can't manage it. 
But I think uh, when she opens up that box and finds those objects inside, it, it's very creepy. But she finds a dead moth. It's a very large moth. It looks like one of those murder hornets, death I head. think. Yeah, yeah, the dead murder head. Yeah, yeah. It did. And, it, yeah. Oh, it did. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And, and but, then and I felt bad for the dad because, like, when when suddenly there's a real live moth. You know, the dad instinct is the daughter screaming, kill it. And then everybody turns on him for killing it on the bed or killing it at all. He should have taken it outside. You know, that's like, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I thought that was another good kind of typical family situation. Very realistic. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, she finds in there uh, a tooth, which was pretty gross and which comes back into play later on with the dentist as well. Which is actually this tooth right here. Wow, uh, the tooth that was in the box. Okay, not really. It was in here. It happened to have it handy. Let's let's move on. Uh, <laughs> and little, I can't think of what else she finds in there. In there. It, yeah, it, <laughs> it seems like a, a little uh, like a bird anyway. skeleton. Oh, yeah, there was a bird skeleton. Cotton balls of cotton and little containers with de desiccated life. Mm. Uh, very a mirror oh, mirror on the lid yeah and the ring yeah the ring. so but she takes out mm -hmm. and promptly puts on and then all hell breaks loose really yeah you know, we don't we don't learn much about the ring i mean i i thought it might have vaguely been reminiscent of the uh the sort of the ring of solomon which was supposed to be able to control demons so it wasn't uh, the ring of Gollum. <laughs> It, it was not the ring of Gollum. It wasn't right, the, so. that wasn't uh, her or golem. <laughs> or, was, yeah. I thought it looked like one of those kind of sporting rings, you know, that uh, when players on a football team or something get a, yeah, a ring. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Like yeah. To me. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is when we actually do get to see the Divic later, uh, Gollum does come to mind. Um, yes, very much so. Yeah, yes. yeah. Creepy very little demon baby kind of a thing. Done, but yeah. then is is positioned as being a, a woman from the sound of the voice, which we start to see the presence of the demon, uh, the hand coming out of the little girl's mouth. And um, when she's munching on fries in a restaurant and she just keeps eating and she's you know, starving and that voice comes out of her saying she's still hungry. And that sounds like a, a woman to me. So it's kind of strange mm -hmm. that then the, the demon's baby-like. It well, also reminded grow. me of the... Uh, was it... Uh... Chris Farley, when he did the skit in the mall where he was supposed to be on a diet and he keeps eating French fries, and they tell him to stop. He's like, no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the scene too where um, she's eating pancakes for breakfast and she just keeps shoving them in her mouth and the father yes. tells her to slow down and she stabs him. That's that was a good surprising. Point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That, that's one that of those was... memorable scenes, though, you know, that, that make you think, yeah, that was a good movie because uh, that, that came out of nowhere. You didn't expect that. And uh, and, and the injury on his hand never really got brought up again because that way it did not. He was remarkably point. calm for having been yeah. stabbed in the hand with a fork. Yeah. And the fork was hanging out of his hand, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. and he's like, it was like, my gosh, that was peculiar behavior from my daughter. I need yeah. to investigate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Nobody cusses in this movie except for the girl at one, one point in the film, like, this, it's there was it was remarkably stayed uh, performance of, in the from the dirty language department. Like hardly anybody's, I believe the the, the f bombs would have been dropping pretty fast in my house when things started Absolutely. to go south. Yeah, no, so, definitely. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just uh, the moth and like nothing supernatural. Just the moth in the bed would have probably got a a a a, 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 a priest worthy uh, cascade of, of of blasphemy. I think <laughs> I knew I had one around which... here somewhere. Yeah, it's not a <laughs> not a bent one. Um, um, not yet. But the times think, they are changing. Yeah, I think that uh, the the moth scene. So we should talk a little bit more about that, and that really yes. reminds me of Amityville with the flies. Yeah, and yeah. Further to the idea that the director of the film, I can't remember his name. It's Ole Bornadal. He's a Danish director, and he says more. that he was very heavily influenced by uh the exorcist and that scene i think in particular it really is, is very uh very strong that uh he was oh, yeah. influenced by it to see all of those moths and that is genuinely a creepy scene with a little girl on the bed and it looks like she's uh in a trance or something looking in the mirror yeah. moths everywhere and it just seems like an infestation in this new home just a yeah. bad neighborhood well, and the, yeah. the uh, two things uh, for, again for meta metaphor, the 
the moth obviously symbolizes change, uh, you know, going from a caterpillar to, you know, this, this flying other form uh, and also the devouring of fabrics. Uh, but, but the other thing is they're constantly using drone shots of uh, top down views of the neighborhoods and buildings. And it's, I think in a sense, that's yeah. supposed to show us that in everybody's in a box all the time. Like, so you're constantly dealing with these boxes uh, as, as the film progresses. So wow, I you're good wanna, at this, Blake. So. <laughs> That's some good analysis there because I didn't yeah. really. Wow, you should be part of a show. Yeah. <laughs> talking about things like actually break this. down things. Yeah, that would be <laughs> awesome. You'd do good at that. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's uh, that was one of the things. Uh, the uh, um, it was uh, uh, is that the uh, the artist, um, the musician that played uh, the the. Uh, I don't know if he was a rabbi yet or in training. He was the what? son of a rabbi. The son of a rabbi. And, yeah, a son of a rabbi. Yeah. yeah. And then he was also, in, in real life, he is, uh, that, as he said, these curls are real in one of the little bonus features. Mm. Uh, yeah, he is a Hasidic Jew. Uh, yeah. and, uh, not a costume, so he was, yeah. <laughs> not a costume. Yeah, he's, he's not acting. Have you so, listened yeah. to any, his, any of his music? I have not. It's very, uh, um, it's kind of like... Uh, Bob Marley, but a little less <laughs> reggae. Well, that's catchy. Yeah, no, it's good stuff. Nice. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And I thought, yeah, he played that role very well. He mm -hmm. came across as just very gentle and very concerned. I guess we're leaping ahead at this point uh, to the point where they're requiring an exorcism. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the rest well, of the community are just kind of turning their backs and uh, on the, the father and the little girl and saying it's left up to God to decide mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Yeah, but as, as as the daughter, I mean, because I, I think the plot is sort of dealing with the idea of is she really possessed or is she uh, just reacting to the divorce that's going on? Of course, mm -hmm. as the audience, we're seeing a, a very explicit, uh, clear indications that, that that there's something supernatural going on. So it sort of creates that dramatic irony of we know something that the rest of the people don't. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. It really comes across as she's just unhappy because of you know, the, the broken home situation. And at the same time, as though the father's turned violent. And there's that one yeah. scene where something slaps her. And from the perspective of the teenager, it looks like the father's slapping the little girl exactly. around. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, everyone, as you say, dramatic irony. Um, but, we're seeing I everything. Don't throw, yeah, I don't want to throw away the fact that at school she begins to act out, attacks one another student because the kid decides to steal her bag, which has she snuck the dipic box into the school. We, we know, in like a great, you do. big yeah. duffel yeah. bag. Yeah, Very that was really sneaky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but then, the, who who gets the... punished for this? The, the the teacher gets killed. I think she's our first on screen death, and like she did nothing to deserve that death. You well, know, yeah. yeah. And I so, think yeah. well, she she confiscated the box, and she was the one well, who said, "I think yeah. I think if she spends some time away from the box, that that will be for the best." But, but dad uh, goes yeah. and throws it in a dumpster. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing. And that's one of those plot holes that Matt <laughs> has talked about. Why is it yeah. that the father wasn't killed? You know, why is it that the, the Jew is killed towards the end and that this teacher is killed? All of these, uh, you know, well, to some extent, well, innocence. And well, yet uh, the parents aren't killed. And so many times, too, the scene that Matt referred to earlier with the, the little girl with the meat in her mouth and um, just destroying the kitchen. I mean, at that point, she was holding a shard of glass and she could have killed the mother. And why did she not? Well, there was a lot of really over-the-top vulgar displays of power. Um, <laughs> but it didn't seem like they had purpose because every time you would expect that to come out and, you know, take care of things, it didn't. It only happened mm -hmm. in these kind of jump scare moments. And, and uh, so that was disappointing. But I also want to say about the whole slapping thing is, you know, if you watch that, you can see the marks on her face. Oh. And that was a total nod to The Exorcist again. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I, and, uh, well, I thought which, another which I, I consider nod. that to be a bit of a, a bit of a, a, you know, homage to The Exorcist. Well, I think, I don't think he was another saying. nod to The Exorcist was the MRI scene where yes. little girls having all of these tests to see what's wrong with her from a psychiatric point of view. And uh, I have to say, having had an MRI, it's not exactly like that. Um, you know, perhaps it might be in, in some instances, but I did think that that was very creepy when, I mean, you wouldn't have 
the whole family in the room watching as this is taking place, you know, <laughs> you would starters. die. You would die. But I did think it was creepy to see this face appear right next to the little girl's heart well, with the MRI I loved it. I mean, results. It's a great effect. It, it but but Terrifying. as you say, the MRI does slices and then they reconstruct them in the computer. It's yeah. not a it's live not a film view. Footage. It's not an instant right, right, yeah. It, yeah. So, but it was a super creepy idea to have literally to be able effective. to see the demon. Yeah, well, and I think but the yeah. demon knew where to look too. Yeah, yeah. It was you know, and they go. Rah. <laughs> You know, yeah. Yeah. you knew well, where to look so it looked like, it was, you know, from the screen. It was certainly a plot device so that the mother would start believing in what was happening and that it wasn't yeah. the father's involvement. It's yeah, real. Absolutely. And, but but the, yeah. what about the mask that she had to wear to hold her head down? Is that something they do more for children, you think? Because I've I know never you seen that before. That. Uh, yeah, well, me neither. I think, but I want a Halloween costume that has well, that. I think she would be sedated. I don't think that they just would have put her through that, you know, and, and they do you have a little thing to position your head and often a pillow and they usually give you earplugs as well. So again, I think it's, it's very like loud. Yeah. Yeah. Extremely loud. And it is very much like uh, the exorcist where they're just subjecting her to these torture like uh, yeah. tests. And, and I think just to kind of instill that extra fear in you that, oh, this poor little girl undergoing all of this and she's suffering so much. Well, it's kind of well, like uh, the, the rabbi's son says, I don't like hospitals. Um, yeah, People I think we all, we all get that <laughs> yeah, feeling, yeah, yeah. you know, that we don't like this hospital. Um, well, little did he know he was on his way to his own death shortly thereafter. <laughs> yeah, that's well, true. <laughs> Another well, you know, it was all about we, we, I love the fact. Okay, so we're we're alluding to the fact that that this uh, this son of a rabbi comes to help, but Seems we like sort of left insult. out the part. <laughs> we let we we love we left out the part where how did we how did he get involved, which is uh, which is that father figures out by talking to another expert at the college where he, he's a basketball coach at college. He goes to a religious studies guy and that guy says this is uh, the word for a Jewish demon. Mm -hmm. And this is a box designed to keep one inside. And, you know, and when he realizes that he needs help. He he jumps in his car and drives to the closest, I guess, place he can think of where he'll find lots of Jewish people. He finds New a rabbi York. in New York City. So I thought that's a little stereotypical. I mean, <laughs> I mean, they probably also have rabbis in in Rochester. You know, no. like you don't necessarily have to go down to New York City. But it yeah. was very well, they, cool to see that. I mean, pretty you know, fun. New York and Hollywood—that's the so. only places they are. Yeah. So. But I couldn't I quite tell where he that... was going too, if it was Albany or, or exactly where he was going. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he went down to New York city. There's a large Hasidic uh, Jewish community there. And, and he went and talked to some rabbi and I love their hats. They were wearing, I don't know what those are called, but they were, I think of it as the big Russian uh, Orthodox type oh, fur hats. Yeah. And, uh, and, sure. and, and, and he went, he, uh, I think he meant the skull cap. So, Oh no, no, the, the yarmulkes. Cool. Yeah, no, I, no, I was, I was talking the, just, I love the, the idea of bringing in, uh, you know, this like, this would be the scene if this was a sort of a Christian movie, it would be the scene where you go get the Catholic priest, you know, mm -hmm. so we're getting yes. a rabbi instead. And it's, I love the idea of like matching your spiritual protection to the sort of origin of the demon. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's, yeah, uh, and that's kind of cool. Think yeah, I think it is it is cool to see those differences. And I think that there's just something a little bit more creepy about these Orthodox Jews performing a uh, an exorcism as opposed to a priest. I think just um, in terms of what we're familiar with, we're so used to seeing Catholic exorcisms and, and that's the stereotype. So this- mm -hmm. when, when you say just, creepy, do you mean just exotic? Like it's because it's just not as often depicted? I think, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. it's not not- you know what we're familiar with we're familiar with the whole yeah. exorcist idea with the the purple um yeah, the is, stole, uh, yeah. stole uh yeah and just that that is kind of the the stereotype for seeing an exorcism so to see it this way i think just added an, an element of of being you know different and and not knowing what to expect would also yeah, add to yeah, this yeah, sort of universality of a... <laughs> what <laughs> go ahead go ahead <laughs> I was going to say it added to the universality of demonic possession that like maybe every religion has some kind of demons well, and yeah. how to deal with them. Yeah. Which is oh, yeah. pretty and true. Yeah. A yeah, lot of people got, don't yeah. think that we, we don't think of that outside of our own experience or what we're familiar with. And Yeah. I, it was a, a very interesting thing to watch that. And, and the, the, the rabbi who's going to be doing the exorcism is this, it's the same as a Catholic priest as they are a represent representative of of god 
and they're they're there assuming basically God's power to say, get out of here. You know, you well, don't belong I'm, here, demon. And so it's kind of strange when they're the like, Lord. they're like, uh, yes, yeah, just leave it up to God. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. Aren't you supposed well, to go and represent God? You know, um, well, I thought it was uh, interesting the scene where the father attempts an exorcism and he goes to see the little girl. I think she's homesick mm -hmm. from school that day and the other daughter is heading off to school and he sits on her bed and starts reading from the, the Torah and pretty quickly, I think she turns her head to look at him and just gives him the stink eye, as, as Matt said earlier, it, it and then was, the book just it was, flies across the room. It was a terrible experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. But it, it was just, it was amusing to see that, just how pathetic his attempt was and it was, know, how, how yeah. this, this power was uh, much stronger than him. Yeah, and again, that was another one of those displays of power that could have been used in other ways. But uh, yeah. yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, she could have well, just about... you know, closed the door before he came in the room, maybe. I don't know. Um, what about the exorcism itself? So I think that they're down in the morgue, aren't they? They um Well, they they I... go to the the physical therapy place first, uh, which is which he knew from basketball. And then from there, the at one point the demon escapes the room and goes to the morgue, which for some reason is full of dead bodies and no refrigeration. That was very yes, weird. That's was like, exactly what I said to Matt. Like, I said, yeah. was there some weird and, tragedy? Where it was like well, 30 corpses and no AC. It was well, I wonder if the room itself might have been <laughs> a big refrigerator. Uh, you know, yeah, it may be, but even We're still, that used wasn't to typical. I don't know. Yeah, it seemed a little strange. Yeah, yeah, but it was whole DOA tags, tags and everything. And yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, I think that certainly added to the creepy factor that they're in a morgue, and I think it was kind of foreshadowing what was going to happen to. Well, it kind of made Maybe. you feel like you had to be on guard for these dead bodies to do something, you know, hop up and dance thriller or something. Because, um, <laughs> you know, why did they need to be there other than it was just kind of a low-level creep factor? So. Well, that and it was a really uh, familiar spot for our main character, Jeffrey Dean, because he's used to Morgan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Nice no. One. But... <laughs> well... Was it really? It was not. It was not. <laughs> like those dead bodies, it's a stinker. Sorry. What... <laughs> oh, boy. But I did think that the exorcism itself was um, a little kind of wishy washy, really. Um, you know, it, it didn't last terribly long and the words. demon very quickly transfers from the little girl into the father who's screaming, take me, take who me. Who kept saying over and over again, I guess that he had definitely seen the exorcist because he yes, said, take me, father, take yeah, me. Yeah. 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 I was yeah. like, okay. Yeah. Definitely a nod to that. But then that <laughs> seemed pointless. Uh, you know, like in the exorcist, take me, take me. Okay. Now you're in my body. I've got a little bit of control left. I'm going to jump out the window and take you with me. Uh, I, okay, I've got you now. I'm going to fall asleep. Yeah, well, he kind of slumped over and yeah, I mean, so, eyes yeah, the, rolled the, back into his head. And the, the, the Dybbuk could be a little bit like, okay, I am going to choose this moment to jump into your body because you're bigger, you're stronger, and I can utilize that in some way. Mm -hmm. um, but I've got this downtime, you know, of, of 20 minutes or so before I can actually do anything. Is this a good time to make the jump? And the demon didn't plan ahead, I think, in this sense, and didn't think about that downtime because it gave them plenty of time to finish the uh, exorcism. Yeah. Well, well I the think first it... time we see the possession, we see all the the moths flying into the little girl sort of exhibiting. And like, but hmm. but in between when it jumped from the little girl to the dad, we didn't see any of that transfer. It just it just happened off screen. Yeah, well, there was a yeah, couple, he think, had some um... moths flying in, didn't he? Or were they flying uh, out? Maybe I didn't uh, see him. I, I when they flew they out, did. when he when he, yeah, they flew out. Yeah, I think to to show that that was that he was possessed. But yeah, the mm -hmm. the whole thing, I think him being possessed and then this demon leaving him was kind of without incident. And you hear of a lot of uh, stories, uh, anecdotes when it comes to exorcisms with the kinds of things that happen. You'll hear a shotgun or or something else like that when the the demon leaves. But this one just kind of slunk away, back into the box, and, yeah. and that was it. <laughs> Enough yeah. Said. So, so they put it in the box, <laughs> they close it up, they throw a prayer cloth over it and mm -hmm. our, uh, not rabbi, uh, loads it into Jeffrey D. Morgan's car, which Jeffrey D. Morgan says, you could just keep the car. I'm staying here. Keep it. Like, yeah. And I don't, that's need not actually how drive. car transfers work. That's <laughs> not a thing, but yeah, it yeah, all worked it out. It was a pretty okay. nice car for a coach too, but I wanted to say, we've got to talk about the Dybbuk's name, how 
kind of like Rapunzel, they needed to discover the name of the, the demon. And that was, I think, a bizu, which meant taker of children. It's a handy was... word to have in your vocab. So quite yeah, creepy. Yeah. I mean, from the first scene anyway, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a thing, but it seemed to to have a, a focus on um children rather than than adults. Yeah. Well, although it started in an old lady and spent some time in Jeffrey Dean Morgan. So yeah. Yeah. And it yeah, didn't didn't get rid of any of them, but but again, anyway. here, so, this this box is supposed to house the the Dybbuk. It's supposed to mm -hmm. keep it under control. It's supposed to keep it from doing anything. Again, we have a vulgar display of power at the end when it's in the Dybbuk box and under control and under a prayer. True. That's a good everything. point. So yeah. I, I don't understand how the Dybbuk managed to have a semi truck hit uh, the car and have have the car obviously, you know, have uh, the uh, the rabbi's son not paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, the whole and thing just kind of seems strange. Like, wasn't there a scene in either the poltergeist or Amityville where someone was injured in a car? Yeah, I think uh, priest. The, the we had the priest. We had the the, vom Which the movie vomiting was it, nun uh, in uh, the uh, uh, Amityville. Okay, uh, okay, in the original, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so we the had priest. The... He he was sick, and then he was in a car accident. There was all kinds of stuff that happened to him to keep him from coming back to help clear the house. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. But when I think we probably. The... We probably spent long enough talking about the movie and the plot. We should start talking about the the, the true, true story. story. Well, I mean, obviously, this this story is so incredible, and you know, people died, and it was very, as you say, so many vulgar displays of power. There should be lots of documentation for the true story. Then, I guess. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you want to lay it on so. us? <laughs> It, oh, I don't want to. This is one of those cases that when it first came out, like that when it first hit the world uh, as a paranormal story, I was I was fascinated because um, it sounded like a scheme to sell something on eBay. Exactly. Uh, and, right. and, and that's yes. it's what it sounded like. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that, well, in fact, we should probably expound on what the claims are before we but get that into was what actually happened. Right yeah. around the time that a lot of things were being sold on eBay, on Etsy, haunted items. So this was really in keeping with that kind of you know, belief and, and story. But I get a little yeah. confused because you've got a number of players in this story. Uh, there's Kevin Manis and there is Jason Haxton. And I get a little confused as to who kind of kickstarted all of this uh, because I don't know that there was a website and then there was the Dybbuk box which was being sold on eBay and just a lot of people telling stories and then kind of backtracking uh, mm -hmm. so I, I think it gets a little confusing from this point suffice to say it's not true <laughs> well I think it was Kevin Manis that really snowballed this into something ridiculous matzo balled it into something ridiculous I guess if you will um, it just it was around 2001 and, you know, he claims he went to, uh, um, he wanted to get th this little wine cabinet uh, as an odd gift for his mother. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the story goes that his, his father used to get his mother a plaid dress every year for her birthday and uh, without fail. And the thing was, is she hated plaid. So he would give that to her and then she could take it back to the store and get whatever she wanted. Uh, and, and that just made it easy for him. So it kind of started a tradition of getting strange gifts. So he saw this, uh, this wine cabinet and decided that it would be the perfect gift for his mother. Mm -hmm. Well, I should say what they found inside of this. So it was a little different. It wasn't a tooth. It wasn't a, a dead bird or moths or anything like that. <laughs> uh, so we didn't go back to talking about the, the dentist either. that you reminded me. Oh, but yeah. so inside this, this wine cabinet, uh, there were two locks of hair. There was a granite slab, I think, with some um, Hebrew written on it. Uh, there was a, a dried rosebud and a goblet and two wheat pennies. I don't know what a wheat penny is. A, a and wheat penny, penny is, is on the backside. Instead of the Lincoln Memorial, they have two oh. uh, wheat, wheat, uh, like stalks of wheat, wheat coming together. Oh, okay, yes. very, very Jewish. Wheat. Yep. wheat. <laughs> so a candlestick as well and a dibbuk. Yeah, that was yeah, an unexpected 
thing that was in there. But we saw the mother recounting the story on uh, TV. I can't remember what the name of the show was. It was a paranormal. A uh, witness, paranormal witness. stories. Yeah. yeah, kind of show. And she was retelling the story. And I mean, she was, she truly believed in it. And it appeared as she was speaking as though she'd had a stroke. And that was the case. And the way they positioned it was as though he presented this gift to her, the son, and then he walked away. And as she's looking at it, she experienced a stroke. And uh, she was unable to speak and uh, unable to communicate with him and uh, with the son. And finally he came back in the room and called for an ambulance. But she was very firmly placing blame on this box that that is what uh, had caused her stroke. And so I don't know what the correlation is between when that took place, but she certainly presented it and he presented it as though the box had caused her stroke. Right. When she was trying to become verbal again, she was writing messages to him saying like bad gift, you know, <laughs> like the effective message was do not want this is bad. Don't Get want rid of no it. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 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 I can't exchange this for whatever I want. Right. Right. You yeah, missed the plaid, plaid dress. Jacket. Thank you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> but then we have other people too. I mean, what I find is strange. And I think it was the, the other fellow was it, uh, Jason Haxton, who'd had the Dybbuk box, who purchased it at another point, and he'd had it for about two decades and talked yeah. about all of these terrible things that had happened to him. Why wouldn't you get rid of the, the bloody thing in, because in he that was period of time? blogging about it and writing a book about it. That's Yeah, yeah. So. well, exactly. But I mean, if you truly felt that this thing was evil, you would get rid of it. You wouldn't keep it. A lot of people stay in troubled relationships for reasons that are really hard to explain. So, yeah. <laughs> With boxes, yeah. It's complicated. It's complicated. Uh, but uh, it, it's interesting to see now, if you go and Google Dybbuk boxes, there are so many of them for sale and people actually recreating very beautiful versions um, and, and selling them. But uh, they're, they're still pretty popular. And yet it seems as though, I guess, to get to the crux of it, that Dybbuk's are a thing in terms of belief in Jewish tradition and folklore, but a Dybbuk box right. is not. Is not, exactly. Yeah, it was yeah. created by Manus, Kevin Manus. Um, yes. And, and that's, a, you know, really uh, interesting thing for him to come out and, and talk about. It, it's, it's rare. It's, it's funny. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the thing cool. that's funny is, you know, one interviewer, um, called him up and he was, you know, like admitting the whole thing to him. And then when the interviewer started like hitting him with some tougher questions about it, he started kind of uh, uh, waffling and and going back on some of his story. You know, it, it's a little bit like the Fox sisters. Yes, um, yes. it's back exactly what I was thinking. It's, yeah, yep. we're it's completely true, fixed. it's not. It's true, it's not. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, it did finally, you know, then he got a hold of the, the interviewer again, said, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready for all the hard questions. Go ahead. <laughs> and it was a little bit like he was trying to get the interviewer to kind of beat it out of him. He wanted to let, uh, he wanted to let the demon go. Um, wanted to be yeah. free of the lie. I mean, it's, it, it is yeah. a yeah. burden to keep having to mm -hmm. tell the same story. You, you mm -hmm. know, it's just, it well, is. What offends me with this story is that he was linking it, the box to uh, a previous owner, a Polish woman who had been, uh, who was a Holocaust survivor. So I think capitalizing on that kind of story is is, is the real evil here. That's right. a horrible yeah. thing it to gets, do. It gets a little crazy because he says she was trying to summon some magical force to help conquer Hitler and mm -hmm. it went wrong. And so what she summoned had to be trapped in the box to protect everybody. And that since she'd done Over this, many top. horrible things had happened, like, you know, World War II, Korea, all these different, like the Vietnam War, all these things are attributable to the, the mistake of letting this thing out. But then when you really... hear about the other stories that, that these owners talk about, it's things like nightmares and I had some bad yeah, luck. Toe. I had some yeah, yeah. <laughs> had some mis misfortune. So a little bit my different. My cake fell. What? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. The little... team was canceled. <laughs> but there is a, an episode of The Twilight Zone uh, where a, a man has trapped the devil. Uh, and while the devil's trapped, you know, it helps keep evil out of the world. And, and uh, he had to track the devil down because he had acts. It's called The Howling Man. It's a really fun story, but it's uh, by Charles Beaumont. And uh, he had um, 
he had found the devil captured and accidentally gets tricked into releasing him and then has spent many years hunting him down and capturing again. And now he's got him and everything's going to be okay. And then in the end, somebody lets him out again because the devil's very tricky. But the whole point being that all the, all the perils and evils of the world are caused by Satan running loose is, uh, is very simplistic, very widely believed. And in my opinion, a, a, a cop out. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But yeah, uh, well, I've got the, um, go ahead. Oh, what were you going to say? Because I, I want to go into the confession from Manus. Well, I was going to talk a little bit about the ad that he, the eBay uh, listing. Oh, sure. Yes. And yeah. I mean, it was the, the eBay listing was so long and detailed and, 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 and everything else that it, uh, you know, some people calling the, the divot box an urban legend. Um, and it doesn't quite fit that because it's uh, it, it is so mapped out and, um, uh, it's not so much, oh, my, you know, cousin's daughter's neighbor. Right, you know, right. So, so it's it's not really an urban legend. It's just a work of fiction. And mm. this guy wrote a beautiful fiction uh, for this this uh, eBay uh, posting. And um, it was, you know, to, to any person that's of that mindset, it was very convincing. You know, he covered all the bases very well. Um, and of course, you know, prices started going up, not as much as I would expect it. I would have thought the price would have gotten higher. Well, um, yeah, you can we do know that, that you tens know, of thousands of dollars for a, a you know, Jesus on, uh, on a toast. cheese yeah. sandwich. <laughs> yeah. And this only went for, I think about $200. I think yeah. initially it went for 100 and something. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. second time around, it was 230, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not that much. We don't know what Zach paid for it. Uh, it was an oh, you spoiled amount. it now. I was going to say, where is it now? Okay. Well, then I'll just chop, chop that out. That's no okay. problem. There you go. There you go. So just make sure that you do that gesture. Where is it now? So, well, and, and where is it now? Oh, you want to do that now? The big box now. Well, yeah. Unless you've got anything more to say, because I was going to go into the, the confession. No, there was a, a particular guy that uh, we discussed um, on our Haunted Objects uh, Monster Talk Live uh, that has one of these museums by the name of Zach Bagans. Yeah, Bagans. Bagans. I, I, tea Bagans. Bagans. Uh, Scooby yeah. Douche, uh, whatever <laughs> you want to call him. Uh, he uh, He purchased this for an undisclosed amount. And yeah, I'd like to know how much he paid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he has, uh, it, it's in his little museum making money for mm -hmm. him there. But uh, he is really pushing hard the idea that this is the most haunted object on earth. And so much so that a lot of people are taking that for granted that it is the most haunted object on earth. Although we know for a fact that Zach has never exaggerated or faked anything in his entire career. Well, I've got a quote here. So I think it was earlier on during the, the pandemic where he and some of his cohorts stayed in the museum for a couple of weeks doing some you know, quarantining themselves. And uh, so it doesn't sound like a publicity stunt or anything like that. And during <laughs> this time, they opened the box. So here's a quote from Zach. So they opened the box and the scariest moment for me is what I saw and felt. We captured on camera an unbelievable mist coming out of the box that manifested eyes. The lead investigator also believes he saw the Dybbuk entity crouching down towards the wall behind the box. So, I mean, truly, so if this thing out. was capable, but if it was capable of all of these things, as in the movie, as in the, the stories, the narratives, um, you'd be getting the hell out of there, wouldn't you? This thing was going to stop Hitler. <laughs> they, they didn't they didn't show that effect in the film and that seems like a missed opportunity well i don't know you can yeah. see a little bit here yes yeah but, yeah. but then but post no no a missed opportunity <laughs> oh yeah. was, uh, no i heard you i was just okay. ignoring <laughs> you ignoring yeah. <laughs> um no, the thing is, is yeah, that that was the night. Post Malone was there, correct? That was yeah, the big. That's, uh, that's right. Oh, yeah, the rapper, yeah. of of Post Malone, and Lots he never actually touched it. He never actually touched it. So um, and now his face is covered in tattoos. How can mm -hmm. science but, explain this? Yeah, he yes. said yes. Yeah, some of his experiences, I think it was in that kind of yeah. He had some bad luck. You know, he IBS. lost some money on the horse or something. I don't know. <laughs> 
but yeah, well, it wasn't anything very serious. But I think that the the most interesting part of all of this is that all the things that Zach has said, I think he's said somewhere else that the box has not yet finished, <laughs> that it, there's a lot more that it's going to to do to accomplish whatever. Yeah, but that was but even think... in response to uh, them saying, oh, did you not hear that this was all a well, hoax? That's exactly where I'm going. So mm -hmm. Manus wrote a Facebook post. This is October 24th, 2015. He said, I am the original creator of the story of the Dybbuk box, which appeared as one of my eBay posts back in 2003. The idea that Dybbuk boxes have some kind of history prior to my story and the idea that a Dybbuk box could contain anything other than a Dybbuk, along with any deviation to the type of contents I created to be found inside of a Dybbuk box, is laughable at best. How about this? If you or anyone else can find any reference to a Dybbuk box, so sick, in history prior to my eBay post, I'll pay you $100,000 and tattoo your name on my forehead. And yet it seems to be Post Malone that tattooed something on his forehead. So It's true. But, <laughs> yeah. but uh, now, yeah, so it, it has done nothing, I think, to um, alleviate the fear and belief that a lot of people have in this whole well, idea. They've, they've done two things here. They've, they've basically said that because he did this. Now, he claims he is such a devout uh, Jew, that, yeah, and he studied the Kabbalah and everything else, and he's so devout, then why did he create this big lie, if that's the, the case? The box. <laughs> yeah, the divot yeah. box. Um, you know, he created this huge lie, and it's it's steamrolling forward still. But they're saying because he did that, he actually cursed the box by doing it. There's that aspect. Or there's the idea that thought forms are a real thing, and everybody believes <laughs> that yeah exactly <laughs> now you can't deny it blake because yeah. you know enough people believed in it now it is cursed um well, and i have to in, say yeah, yeah. I, I, okay. I i'll say this the black eyed kids same thing one guy writes a very fascinating and spooky internet story internet and then what legends, happens yeah everybody starts writing their own and then it happened to me yeah. the little black eyed kid showed up it's the same thing and when he's done no, and i don't on. believe put, in put the brakes on blake i'm gonna yeah. stop you right here because uh okay we were gonna record yesterday this show why didn't we i got oh, cursed yeah. yep with a no? sore throat <laughs> yeah, I guess I had a sore throat. And how can science explain this? But then we resumed you see it this? today. So you see this? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I do. I was, I Is that was, a power band? Yeah. I was, I wish that would be awesome. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was walking bullets and I got <laughs> shot in the arm. No, uh, I was cleaning the basement and I managed to fall up the stairs. Answer that one, science. I yeah, fell no, up I'm the no. stairs and I got a gash on my wait, arm wait that was wait do you see my hemorrhoid hold on what yeah. and, and i'm and i'm married to matt so yeah bad luck how can science time. explain yeah. this yeah. Yeah. yeah so and that's all because we're doing this show so yeah. but in, in all i just the idea so i don't believe there's a supernatural element but i do believe that stories in our minds take on a life of their own and in that whole absolutely like you see people sharing things on the internet and then mm. some people can't leave it at that they have to put their own little twist on it and they you know yeah. that you can call it memes or whatever you want but people love to share stories and make themselves a part of it and keep it's these legends alive it's a communal alive. reinforcement yeah, as well it I is think. it absolutely is and so he's yeah. he's brought something to life i don't think it's demonic but it's certainly narrative so yeah, yeah. absolutely well said yeah well I think on that note, there's not really much more to say about this. I mean, it, it's a hoax, um, but it is it, it exists as a thing because for cultural reasons, um, and it's a, a movie. And I think it's a pretty fair movie. Like you didn't like it very much. I didn't, but you know, uh, tastes vary. It was very pretty. It was easy to watch. So you well know, films. you won't hurt your eyes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, it wasn't to my taste, but uh, then I have terrible taste. I mean, look at me. I, I some reason didn't true. like this beautiful. I didn't. I did. I didn't like this beautiful movie. But I love Italian horror from the seventies. Eh, who could explain this? I don't know. So. Science. <laughs> Try to explain yeah. that one. More, more bad <laughs> luck. Yeah. Continues. <laughs> So, um, but thank uh, you for joining us for this discussion, everybody. Yes, yes, yeah, oh, was it was good, fun. It was good fun, fun to talk I, about. I, I do want to say really quickly that uh, the story is ongoing, and the reason it is is because Kevin Manis and uh, Haxton 
are basically having a little bit of a feud and don't seem to like each other. Um, now, Haxton is the one Ooh, that it's wrote the Highgate Vampire all over again. This is yes. great. These things yes. happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and you know, uh, Haxton is the one who wrote the book and sold the rights for the movie and made mm. the lion's share of the money off yeah. of the whole thing. And so he's claiming, oh, he's just jealous of me. He's just jealous. And and uh, <laughs> and and then you've got Manus going, uh, I don't know, jealous. Oh, oh, and I did want to also say the mother's performance on um, was a Paranormal Witness was also fake she uh she did not believe in the the dybbuk box either and she, that was all made up on the spot by her she uh she faked wow. that whole thing she as came well. across as so sincere mm -hmm. that's really i mean yeah, TV he, studio you never know where those improv skills are going to pop up what yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean he uh he said that, that was fraud. a gift from his mother that he he she did that um uh, but uh, tangled web yeah, yeah. Wow. But the, the best thing about that that original Dybbuk box was the way it opened. When you pull out that drawer and the doors open, I mean, it was so mm -hmm. graceful and, and attractive. It felt like something was opening those doors on you. And uh, I think the one in the movie wasn't as cool, uh, other than oh, the fact that it was a puzzle not. box. Yeah, but, it looked, um, yeah, it looked like a stick someone had kind of whittled. <laughs> it so, wasn't as impressive. But uh, uh, wind it up. Is there anything we w that this movie could have done to make it better for you, Blake? Um, I think if I'd had some uh, a Passover wine to go with it, it would have probably helped. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Sounds right. good. Well, well then, let's thank end you it. for watching, everyone. Please do like this video and subscribe to our channel too. Absolutely. And uh, there's this uh, weird website that you can uh, get onto patreon.com slash monster talk. And, not uh, dibbickbox.com yeah yeah no, there's there's too many different spellings of dibbick so dibbick, yep <laughs> so just go that monster talk monster talk is spelled one way and it's as it sounds so go there patreon.com slash monster talk and uh help us keep this going yeah thank you for your support <laughs> thanks a lot okay see you soon Bye bye